Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Welcome, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. Man, I am so excited for you to listen to today's episode. In this episode, I'm interviewing Nick Raskulinitz, which, if you're not familiar with the name, you're definitely familiar with his work. He's worked with bands like Foo Fighters, Rush, Deftones, Korn, Alice in Chains, Stone Sour, and so many other bands. I am so honored to have had the chance to talk to him. He's worked on so many of my favorite records, and uh, I'm a major Foo Fighter fan, so to get the chance to talk to him and chat about some Foo Fighter-related recordings was really, really cool. He's such a cool guy, and uh, he's even, actually, after we recorded, we were having a little conversation off the air, and he had mentioned that he wanted to come back and do an episode where he would answer your questions about any of the projects that he's worked on, so if you have any questions that you'd love to hear him answer, shoot me an email. The email address is questions at masteryourmix.com and I'll start collecting some stuff and hopefully we can have him back and he can get all of the answers that you're looking for regarding any of your favorite albums that he's worked on. So I don't want to waste any more time because this is a great interview. So let's just jump right in. Thanks for being on the podcast, Nick. Really appreciate it. Hey, no problem, Mike. Thanks for giving me a buzz. So for people who might not be familiar with who you are and your story, can you give us a little bit of your background on what your journey's been becoming an engineer? Yeah, totally. Um, I started out engineering in the early 90s, you know, right after high school. I graduated high school in 1989, and um, I took my college, what was supposed to be my college money, and I basically bought a four-track and some microphones and some headphones and a bunch of cables and stuff and turned my mom's garage into a little demo studio so that I could record my own band and... I could also record all my friends' bands <laughs> and just kind of dove into, into sound. And I kind of did it, you know, one of the main reasons I did it was so I could record my own band and I could listen to our songs and try to make them better and work on the arrangements and work on the parts and, you know, work on the vocals and the words and all that stuff. And then it kind of just, it started to kind of snowball into... I started recording all my friends' bands, and I kind of became like the local, you know, rock and metal recording guy. And it was awesome. It was a lot of fun. And I just, you know, growing up, I grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, and, you know, looked, reading magazines, and, you know, there was Mix Magazine and Circus and Hit Parader and all those cool magazines back then, and I, I just knew that there was more, there was more out there, and... I knew there were lots of studio, big studios in New York and in Los Angeles. And I kind of just picked Los Angeles as the spot to go to. I had a couple friends that moved out to Los Angeles in the early 90s, and they would call me all the time. And they would just be like, man, you got to get out of here. It's, it's amazing out here. There's studios everywhere. It's, there's bands everywhere. And I kind of just got in the van and and moved to California without, awesome. you know, any sort of a, any sort of a job or any sort of a guarantee in anything. And, you know, I, I just, I took a big, took a big chance and I left my family and all my friends behind and, and, but I just kind of had this, you know, I, I guess you would call it a dream, you know, of, um, of wanting to be in the music business, but wanting to, you know, I was in bands, so I wanted to. I wanted to. You know, I wanted to be a rock star. That's what I really wanted to do was play in bands. But then, when I got to Los Angeles, I kind of started to realize that that wasn't really going to happen. You know, as quickly and or how I wanted it to happen. So I really kind of, I kind of gravitated more towards the recording aspects of things. And literally, as I was kind of making that transition in my head, I got a call from a friend of mine who I grew up with, a guy named Brian Bell, who played guitar in a band called Weezer. And they just so happened to be recording at their studio called Sound City in the Valley in California. And he told me that they were looking for a runner at the studio. 
and that I should come down there and meet the studio manager. So I borrowed a friend's car, drove to Sound City. I got an interview. I got hired on the spot. That's amazing. And worked like a <laughs> worked like a twenty hour day. <laughs> like my <laughs> first day. My first day at Sound City was Weezer's last day recording the album Pinkerton. Whoa, that's crazy. And I know, isn't that cool? And and I was just like in awe. I was like, oh my God, I'm I'm in a studio, I'm in a real studio and it smells different and it looks different and there's like <laughs> th- there's real stuff in here and holy crap and you know and I met an engineer named Joe Barisi and because he was engineering Pinkerton and we kind of became friends like kind of immediately because we just kind of took to each other and we both had a love for this Japanese band called Loudness and he was super cool and then he was like okay there's a hundred mic cables go roll them up (laughs) (laughs) you know and um I was like all right cool and I went and did it and then you know the next morning at like you know 11 o'clock in the morning I'm driving back to my apartment in Hollywood and I'm like, okay, I'm a runner at a studio now, but I don't have a car. And, you know, I kind of took the job anyway, regardless, because I was determined to figure out a way to do this. And I called my same set of grandparents who left me all the money to go to college. And I was like, look, I'm in California now. I've got this opportunity, but I don't have a car. And, you know, immediately they sent me, you know, like 1300 bucks or something. And I bought some crappy used car. and boom, I was a runner and just kind of, you know, it all just kind of started with that, you know, all of a sudden I'm a runner at a, at a kind of a big name studio where there's gold and platinum records hanging all over the walls from records that I grew up listening to. And it was kind of, you know, thinking back on it now, it was, it was almost like a dream, you know, it was almost like this, this can't be really happening, but it was happening. And I was going, I was an errand boy, basically. I would go get coffee and I would clean the bathrooms and I would go pick up food for bands. And, you know, it was, it was kind of an errand type of job, but also it comes with a lot of responsibility. You know, the assistant engineers count on the runners to help them out because they've got their hands full with the engineers and the producers and the bands and all the stuff that goes along with that. And I really, I just really worked really hard. And, you know, all the kind of experience I had already gathered growing up in Knoxville, recording my own band and recording all my friends' bands, it really, it really helped that whole experience and made it, made it possible for me, yeah. you know, and I, cause I already kind of had a, I already kind of had my head wrapped around how things kind of worked, but I hadn't really done it in that sort of an environment. And I just... You know, at at Sound City in particular, and and kind of the way that, you know, the L.A. studios used to be, per se, was, you know, they worked, you know, kind of from, you know, it was like a ladder. You know, you started as a runner and kind of had to prove yourself to the assistants that you could get people's food orders correct, (laughs) you know, and, and, you know, the producer's dinner wasn't screwed up and you, it was consistency and you did it over and over and over and over again and you made great coffee every single time. <laughs> and you were dependable. You yeah. basically had to be dependable. Yeah. And I, I made sure that I was, you know, and I paid attention and, and you kind of, you know, when the assistant leaves, then the next runner gets to move into their job. And then all of a sudden you're in the control room and you're not, going on errands anymore and making coffee you're plugging in all the mics and you're plugging in all the outboard gear and you're aligning the tape machines and you're you know working on the board and learning how to solder and you know it just kind of it really just kind of snowballed into this assistant engineering position and i did that for a few years you know i think about three years really intense you know seven days a week 12, 15 hour. I mean, a short day was like a 15 hour day. <laughs> I remember so many times hanging out with the other assistant in the other studio and it was like two or three o'clock in the morning and the clients had just left, you know, cause it was a, some city was a band studio. It was 
nothing but bands, rock bands, and, you know, big, famous clients like Tom Petty and, you know, Rick Rubin was always bringing his bands in there. And and then, you know, me and the other assistant are like, you know, three o'clock in the morning, we're like, woo, it was a short day today. I'll see you tomorrow at, you know, see you tomorrow at 11, <laughs> you know, and. It was it was awesome. It was a lot of fun, and it was an education, you know. That was it was it was a hands on education, you know, and it was complete. It was totally vital to what I you know to where I've gotten and where I'm at today because of it. Yeah. You know, and it was it was it was great to be in the room, you know, plugging stuff in and then taking notes on you know, what the producers were doing and what the engineers were doing and how they were micing things, you know, because everybody does this a little bit different. You know, there's certain go-to things that everybody does, but everybody hears stuff in a different way. So there's, you know, you put an SM57 on the top of a snare drum. I mean, that's pretty much what everybody does. But then the chain is completely different after that from most people. Some people like me preamp, some people like SSL, some people like, you know, whatever the fuck, you know, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's always different, you know? So then you start to kind of figure out and make, make those things your own way of doing things and how you hear them. And, um, so then I, you know, I did that for a few years and really got my, my game together and I started to go out into Hollywood and find kick-ass bands to record. I would go to the Coconut Teaser or the Whiskey or the Roxy or the Troubadour or, or a little TV bar like Hell's Gate. <laughs> and you just, because there used to be all these shows that where there would be like, you know, 10 or 15 bands in one night. You could pay five bucks and get in and just sit there and watch bands and if I found a band that I thought was cool, that I liked, I would go up after they were done and introduce myself and, you know, be like, hey, you know, I work at the studio and, and I can, you know, get us five or six hours of, of time, you know, <laughs> between midnight and six in the morning. And look, you guys want to go record a couple songs? And, you know, <laughs> every single band I approached said yes. That's awesome. So I started to kind of make. I kind of started to do what I had done in Knoxville. I started to make demos and make recordings that bands would, you know, shop. You know, they would shop them around L.A. to labels and stuff. And a couple of those bands got got record deals off of the demos that I made with them. And and then my name started to get out around, you know, around Hollywood and around L.A. And and all of a sudden, I had A&R people calling me, you know, saying that they had heard the demo I had made with, with, you know, a band, there's a band called Fireball Ministry that I did demos for and they got a record deal. And there were a couple other bands around the scene that I was working with that were, were getting, you know, major label interest and stuff like that. And, and then just, you know, one thing led to another and that's kind of how it happened. But there, you know, there was one defining moment. There was a producer named Garth Richardson, who is a Canadian. Yep. And, um, he, I had done a bunch of assisting for him. I think we, we made like two or three records in a row. And he would work really, really intense. I mean, he would work, you know, 15, 18 hours a day, like, you know, three weeks in a row, just to the point of just like, you know, just complete intensity and, and dedication. And, you know, you're basically living this, these records. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've heard quite a bit about his work schedule. His dad was a famed producer, and he was actually one of my early mentors. And so he told me all about Garth's kind of his his routine on how he did things. And it sounds like it's it's an intense time. Like you you're really like you said, living those records. Yeah, and you know Garth taught me how to edit drums on two inch tape by basically having you know faith and trust in me that I that I understood what was happening because I used to watch him like a hawk while he was doing it. And he basically, he was making a record, this metal band called Sick of It All, and he basically just threw me in the fire, man. He was like, okay, here's a razor blade, you know, these are the takes. You know, there were like eight drum takes for a song, and he's like, I'm leaving. I'll see you tomorrow at 11. Do this song. (laughs) And I was just like, uh, okay. You know, at that point, all I had ever done is cut leader on the, the tops and backs of reels and leader in between songs. I had never actually edited drums, per se, 
I understood exactly what he was doing and I understood the concept of it because I had watched him do it so many times. And I was actually kind of, you know, I was kind of like the guy waiting in the wings for my chance to do it. And he just <laughs> threw me in the fire, man. He was like, here you go. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was, it was sink or, it was sink or swim time, man. And I swam, you know, and, and he didn't forget that. And, there was a point to where he was, there was a record that he was going to do and um, he couldn't do it because he was so busy. And he like, he was on the phone with a record company and he looked at me and he was like, you know, I can't do it, but I know a guy that can. And he totally threw me my first like bone, like for producing and engineering a record. And he got off the phone. He was like, look, dude, there's this band. They're called Dogwood. They're signed to a, a, a label called Tooth and Nail. And you're going to produce that record. He was like, I'm not going to produce it. You're going to produce it. You're going to engineer it. Here's what the budget is. You know, go. It's go time. And I was just like, okay, cool. Let's go. You know, and that's awesome. That was in 1999. And I have never looked back since, man. I've been going strong ever since then. That's amazing. That's kind of, you know, how it all kind of got got started you know and then from there i gained a lot of confidence and i still kept approaching bands and bands started to come to me i mean you know and uh, somehow i got hooked up with glenn danzig that's I don't awesome really remember how i think it was just through some friends and i engineered engineered and mixed a record with him and that was kind of like the like you know the biggest thing i had done at the time and you know up until you know doing the, the stuff with the Foo fighters i was just kind of doing a lot of local stuff well, I, I guess I wanted to ask you about that too. Like, it seems like the the kind of path for an engineer would be that you would typically start with your local bands, and then as you get bigger in that local scene, you move to more regional bands, and then from there it goes to national bands, and then international bands. And so for you, like getting to that level where you're working with bands like Foo Fighters or Rush, like those guys in a lot of ways are considered like rock gods by by the masses right so how, how do you go about approaching those kind of sessions and like i assume that there's an expectation or a pressure that you must put on yourself obviously like working in those kind of situations and with those higher profile bands yeah there was i mean the, the Foo fighters at the time was you know by far the biggest you know thing i had ever done and it didn't feel like a lot of pressure because you know, me and me and Dave Grohl, we, we hit it off really quickly and he made me feel really comfortable and that kind of alleviated a lot of the pressure, you know. He, there was no like he let me do my thing, you know. Whatever the thing that I do that ba- gravitates bands towards me and they like the records I make and they like my vibe and they like my hang and you know, whatever that is, he you know, he allowed that to happen. You know, and I just did my thing, man, and we hit it off, and we both got a very similar style of energy, and we both like a lot of the same kind of bands and styles of music. And I mean, when I was making that first Foo Fighters record, which is kind of the record that really, really, you know, I mean, that, without a doubt, that record jump started my career. It kicked it into overdrive, and I mean, a couple a couple months before I made that record. I wasn't doing anything, man. I mean, I, I was considering moving back to Knoxville. <laughs> I was like, man, this ain't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. You know, I, I can't get anything else happening out here. And and then that happened, and, and he just let me do my thing, and it turned out great. And, and then, I mean, it was, it was on after that, man. And, you know, and similar with a band like Rush, you know, for – Whatever the reasons are, I mean, you'd have you'd have to ask those guys. But I've, you know, I actually reached out to Rush. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, I, you know, I read online that they were they were getting together to make a new record. This was in 2006, and I called. I had a manager at the time, and I called him. I was like, "Hey, man, I just read that Rush is is they're getting ready to make a new record." You know, I was like call their manager, you know, their manager, and he knew their manager. So he called Ray Daniels and basically said, Hey, I've got this guy, you know, he's doing really well and he loves rush. And 
he would love to know, you know, he would love to have his name thrown in the hat to work with Rush. And the manager basically was like, well, you know, it's too late. They're already working with the guy, you know, but thanks for calling kind of deal. And I was just like, oh, shit. Okay, well, I tried at least, you know, Rush are my heroes, you know. And so I just kind of went on and went on with life and started working on another record. And then a few months later, I got a call back from my manager and he was like, hey, you're not, you're never going to believe this, but Ray Daniels just called me back and said that things had gone south with the Rush, you know, situation that they were working on and the guys in Rush want to meet you. And I was like, my jaw hit the floor, man. I was just like, what? <laughs> I bet. And, you know, the next thing I know, like literally the next day I'm on a plane, I'm flying up to Toronto and I met their manager at the airport. He picked me up. We talked for 20 minutes and the car stops and he goes, all right, there's Kenny Lee's house right there. He goes, uh, call me when you're done with your meeting. I was just like, uh, well, what do you, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> and he was like, go knock on the front door. He's in there waiting for you. <laughs> I was just like, oh, crap, okay. <laughs> and I went up to the front door and knocked on the door and beholding the master answers, peering at it, peering at me out of his round glasses. <laughs> and he was super nice. And, and we went in his kitchen and him and Alex were hanging out, drinking coffee. And we drank a bunch of coffee together and we hung out for probably a good couple hours before we ever even talked about music at all. We talked about the world and we talked about politics and we talked about history. You know, I, I really think those guys were kind of, they were kind of feeling me out to see what kind of person I was. And it didn't really have anything to do with recording at that point. And then eventually at one point, I'll never forget this. I was like, all right, well, like, I came all the way to Toronto. Are you guys going to play some music or what? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were both like, yeah, well, let's listen to some stuff. And, and we went down into Dead's basement studio and they played me some tracks they were working on. And I mean, I immediately was like, okay, this is cool. That's awesome. I don't like this. I don't think that's that great. I think this could be cooler. And, Dead, why are you singing so low? And how come you're not singing high anymore? And they were, they were a little taken aback. I think, I re if I remember correctly, they were a little like, "Whoa, you know, who's this guy?" You know, but I think they could feel my energy. Yeah, that's one thing that I was curious about was like when you're approaching, you know, people like Rush or like you know, working with artists like you know Neil Peart or Dave Grohl or any like any of those people who are seen to be like these gods at their instruments and whatever. Like, how do you go about approaching constructive criticism with them? Is there like, obviously it sounds like you just went right into it and hope for the best and, you know, hope that there was no backlash to that. Right. That's what, that's just how I do. And that's how I am. And that's how my personality is. I mean, I've, I've kind of got this, I say what I think, you know, and I don't really candy coat it. And if I think it can be better, I tell them, and I think that's one of the reasons I've been successful is because when you're working with, you know, super famous people, you know, like Dave Gold or the guys in Rush or, you know, the guys in Alice in Chains or, you know, Corey Taylor, artists like that, they're totally surrounded by people all the time that say yes to everything and tell them how great they are. And, you know, they get a booger in their nose and there's 10 people all reaching for the Kleenex at the same time. I'm not that guy. <laughs> I don't do that. You know, if yeah. you got a booger in your nose, well, there's a Kleenex right over there. You can grab it yourself. Is your arm broke? I mean, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. it was the same thing with, you know, same thing with those guys. And I, I really think that, you know, artists, they're, they're people. They're just, they're people just like we are. And they like to be told when they're doing something awesome but artists also like to be told when they're doing something that could be better. They like to be pushed, you know, true artists, you know, there's a Canadian artist named Ian Thornley that I've worked with a few times and he's one of my all, all time. He's one of my all time favorite people to work with. We made three records together because he's one of the most talented people I have ever worked with. I mean, ever. And he loves to be told he could do it better. I mean, artists like him thrive on that. 
you know, they, they want to be like, oh, you don't think that's great? Well, okay, well, how about this then? You know, and guys in Rush are just like that. Dave Grohl's just like that. Corey Taylor's like that. You know, Chino from the Deftones is like that. Jerry Cantrell is like that. I'm just, that's just who I am, and that's how I kind of handle it. And I'm not a dick about it, you know. I'm, I'm, I try to be very, you know, I'm more of like a coach, you know. The best coaches aren't mean. They're thoughtful, and they try to bring out the best of you in a way that makes you feel good about yourself. And, and I try not to beat people down. And, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a dick about it. I try not to be, you know. I mean, we're we're, just, we're making music here, you know. <laughs> it should be fun. It's true. It should be fun. So then, what's your mindset when you're going into a new project? Like, what kind of stuff are you listening for as you listen to those demos? And like, how how do you? What's the process in your mind of how you dissect the songs? And well, I'm just I'm listening to the songs. I'm listening to the arrangement. I mean, there's a lot of things, man. I'm listening to the songs, the arrangements. I'm listening to the individual parts of you know, what each individual person is playing and might be doing within the song. I'm listening to the vocals and I'm listening to the words and the melodies. I mean, it's, it's, there's not just one or two things. There's probably 30 or 40 different things that I listen to. And, and, and honestly, one of the main things is I listen to how the music affects me personally, because if I can't get some sort of a connection with it personally, then I don't feel like I can I can lend anything to it. Like I don't I don't know what I can bring to the table if I don't like it. So I mean I can I can pretty much honestly tell you that every record I've made I like, you know. I might not I might not love every single song on the record per se, but I probably like it good and I like it good enough to want to spend, you know, days and weeks and months of my life listening to it. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, when you're making a record, man, you listen to one song probably two or 300 times by the time you're done, you know, you get to know every snare drum hit and you get to know every note and every syllable and every vowel sound and every, every, everything about it. It's like reading a book a hundred times, you know, and if it doesn't affect me, then I don't do it. It doesn't really matter who it is. I mean, I've passed on some big, giant, huge rock stars and big, giant, famous bands because I just don't really, I don't like what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So then, in your opinion, it sounds like a good song to you is something that has that emotional connection. Yeah. Yep. If I can't, if I can't connect to it, yeah. then, you know, I, I try to figure out a way to connect to it, you know, and just because I can't connect to it immediately doesn't mean that I might not be able to connect to it later. So, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll have a discussion with a band and I'll talk about, you know, this is what I think and, and see how they react and see if they're going to react and maybe possibly changing it or, you know, being willing, willing and open to working on it to make it better per se, you know, mm -hmm. and nine times out of 10, they, they are, and they will, and they do. But sometimes they don't, and they don't want to, and they think it's perfect the way it is, and that's fine. And, you know, they can move on, and I'll move on, and it's all good, you know? Yep. So then what's a common mistake that you see artists making before they enter the studio? Just getting, you know, demo-itis. <laughs> you know, making a demo, almost making a demo too good and living with it and, you know, playing it for all your friends and rocking it in your car constantly and, and not, you know, loving it so much that when somebody comes along who might think things about it can be better, that you don't think it can, they don't think it can be better and they think it's great just the way it is and they just want to re-record their demo exactly how it's been done. And, I mean, bands don't need me to do that. I mean, bands can make records in their garages, you know, make demos in their garages now that sound like records. So, you know, go for it. Yeah, for sure. So let's shift gears a little bit towards some more of the mixing side of things. In terms of your mix process, do you have a certain workflow that you always stick to in terms of like order of instruments that you like to work in or uh, just anything in process in general? Like, Well, I'm still, you know, I'm still kind of old school, I guess. I guess you would call it old school these days. 
that uh, I still like to mix on a console. I still like to mix on a, on a, on a board, and I like to, you know, spread all the tracks out across the console, and every track will get its, you know, own hue and, and or compression. And I'm not really an in-the-box type of mixer. I've, I've tried to do it, but for some reason I just can't. I can't wrap my head around the way that it sounds. And that, that just for me, you know, there's a lot of guys out there who can mix in the box and make stuff sound amazing, man. And I have people mix my records that mix them just in the box. And, you know, I've been very, very happy with the results. But for me, I just, I can't wrap my head around it yet still. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I like to put stuff out on a console and, you know, the, I mean, the process is, similar but different for everything I mix, you know, I'll kind of, you know, I'll kind of push, you know, spread everything out and I'll kind of just push all the faders up to zero and, and just listen to the instruments. You know, sometimes I'll start with the drums and then I'll turn the, you know, then I'll mute all the drum channels and then I'll put all the guitars up and I'll listen to the guitars for a while and kind of get all the balances together between the guitars and all the different guitar tracks. And then I'll mute all the guitars and then I'll just listen to the bass. And then, you know, I'll kind of go down the line and, and mix all the instruments, you know, at, in groups. And then I'll turn all of them on <laughs> and, and see what it sounds like. And, you know, usually I can get some balances happening pretty quickly and then, you know, I'll start to feel the song. You know, it's a lot easier for me. Well, I shouldn't say it's a lot easier, but it's definitely easier for me to mix things that I've recorded because I've already kind of, I've been listening to it so much. I've kind of got an idea. The record kind of shapes itself as you're recording it. Um, so, but when I'm mixing things that I, that I haven't recorded, like, you know, if you had a band and you sent me your record to mix, sometimes it takes me a little while to, to get to know the song. You know, I'll, I'll, li I'll listen to it for a while and, and try to figure out, you know, what you guys or what, what the band is, is trying to, you know, accomplish with the song and with the sounds of it. And sometimes that happens quickly. Sometimes it takes a day. Sometimes I'll work on a song for a day and send it to the band and be like, hey, is this kind of what you guys are thinking? And, you know, sometimes they'll come back and say, yes, that's exactly what we were thinking. It sounds, it sounds amazing. Or sometimes they'll come back and say, no, that's completely not what we were thinking. Start over. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I've mixed records that I'll work on for two or three or four days, and I just I can't wrap my head around what, you know, what they want. And the mixing is very, very subjective. You know, everybody's got a different opinion, what you might love, I might not like, and what I love, you might not like. So it's mixing is very, very, mixing to me is the hardest part of all of this. Like I, mm -hmm. I definitely prefer recording records and, and getting the sounds and, and getting the spontaneity and the creativity. I kind of prefer getting those things on tape. Not to say that I don't like to mix, but mixing is, definitely more challenging for me and when i succeed at it and i do a mix that makes you know all four or five members of the band happy it makes their management happy it makes the record label happy it makes me happy you know there's like 10 or 12 people involved in a mix that all have to be on the same page and that can be very very challenging sometimes yeah for sure not sometimes all the time <laughs> <laughs> Well, to touch on your point of everybody having different opinions of what the mix should sound like, and, and I guess as a producer, too, just kind of working with that same attitude from the band members and everybody having their own in, in, influence and, and uh, suggestions, but how do you know when you're done a mix or done the, the overall recording and production of something? Because, I mean, you can keep adding layers to things forever with digital these days, and it sounds like you're more analog, but but there's still that... Some some artists do feel that pressure to just kind of keep adding, and if you add more, it'll sound better. What's your approach to that? I uh, my approach to that is it kind of goes on a band by band basis. I mean, you know, I mean to be honest with you, I don't ever record with tape anymore. I just still call it recording the tape. I've been recording digitally at ninety six k since you could you could. I think two thousand four or two thousand five is when I started doing it, and. Um, yeah, it's, it's limitless, you know. For me, it's 
when I start to run out of ideas, you know, I'm always hearing different ideas and different parts of the songs are going by time and time again. And, you know, with the, the layering of things is all about, you know, creating different, you know, tonal environments and creating spaces for things. And, you know, like Allison Chains, for example, is, you know, we've got, you know, a dozen guitar tracks that are all playing the same part, but they're all all the sounds are completely different. You know, it, it creates this this sound that is, is really hard to achieve with just one guitar on the left and one guitar on the right. You know, so you do the guitar on the left and the guitar on the right, and then you come up with a totally different tone and you play it all again. You know, it's a different guitar, it's a different amp. Hmm. And then you do it all again with a you know, a yet a different guitar and a different amp and maybe this this, this pair of tracks has a pe- has a pedal involved and you know, a distortion pedal or a fuzz pedal and you know, the layering So you're not just splitting the amps, you're actually like double tracking or quad tracking and all that kind of stuff, yeah, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'll record two to three different amps per performance and, and each one of those amps will get its own track in Pro Tools and, you know, then I'll mix those within Pro Tools to create, you know, a performance and then, you know, then and then just continue layering all of it. I mean, you know, that, that's how a lot of, you know, modern rock, you know, especially rock and metal recording is. For sure. So what's something that you like to do with your mixes or your productions that other people might think that you're a little crazy for doing? Like, is there any unique techniques that you like to try out? Oh, geez, man, that's a tough one. Um, that's kind of hard to answer because I'm not around a bunch of other people recording anymore. So <laughs> I don't really know what anybody else is Fair doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been in my own studio for going on almost, you know, four and a half years. And I just do my thing, man. I mean, I still am, you know, I still use a lot of real apps. I don't, I'm, I don't use a lot of, like, you know, the direct recording techniques that a lot of bands use now. I still record, you know, real drums with mics in the room. I'm not a huge sample guy. You know, I learned in an era where you didn't start recording until it sounded how you wanted it to sound. You know, I, I never make records going, well, we'll just, you know, put samples on it later or we're just going to reamp it later. I mean, if you get one of my records to mix and you put the faders up, it sounds pretty kick ass, you know? Um, that's a tough one, man. That's, a, that's, a, that's definitely a tough question. It's, and so in terms of like not adding samples and that kind of stuff, what, what has made you stay in the realm you're in and not necessarily follow those trends that, you know, some other modern production or producers would be using these days? Well, like I said, it's, it's, it comes from, you know, the engineering background that I have as well is, is, all the time I spent at Sound City and all the time I spent at the stu- you know, at, at working at different studios in Los Angeles and experimenting, trying different drums, trying different mics on different drums, trying the drums in different spots of the room and, and really, you know, getting those particular sounds at the very beginning of things. And if you do that, those sounds will last all the way through the record. Not to say that I don't put samples on things because I do sometimes, you know, sometimes when you get to the end of a record and you've recorded, you know, (laughs) 20 or 30 tracks of guitar and you made the most giant bass sound known to man that, you know, sometimes the drums do start to get swallowed up by things. So, you know, sometimes I'll put a kick and a snare sample on there and, just to help, you know, those drums poke, you know, poke through the mix. Um, it, you know, every record is different. Every single record is different, you know. Um, I, I think because I don't jump on those trends of a lot of modern recording techniques from the beginning, that it kind of makes my record sound a little bit different when you hear stuff come on the radio or if you listen to the records I make. You know, and nowadays that might be considered, you know, old school or vintage or whatever. But to me, they just sound big. You know, I think the bottom, you know, to me, the bottom end is what makes or breaks a recording. The low end of the kick drum, of the snare, of the bass guitar, of the guitars. You know, the one thing that I, it really bugs me about the way a lot of, a lot of modern records sound today when I hear them 
is it's all about the vocals and the drums. Like guitar and bass have really taken a back seat. And when I was a kid and when I was growing up, it was all about the guitar and the bass and the drums and the vocals, you know, I mean, imagine, you know, stairway to heaven where you could barely hear the guitar, you know, imagine <laughs> Tom Sawyer where you can't hear the guitar, you know, when I listen to the radio nowadays and there's a lot of bands that are, have great songs and the records sound amazing, but I can't hear the guitar anymore. Like the guitar is just kind of turned into, turned into this background noise you know the kicks and the snares are just pummelingly loud and the vocals are really really loud and the louder you turn it up it's almost like the quieter the guitar and the bass get you know Mm -hmm. and i'm not really I, i don't really know why that is i don't know if it's because people are using a lot of you know simulators and and things like that to record guitar with but to my ear the you know the best guitar sounds are still with a mic and a cabinet and a head and a guitar and that that air that have that space that happens between the microphone and the speaker you know even if it's just a few inches you know frequencies develop in that in that little bit of space and when you're recording you know with direct boxes and things like that now but they don't have that it's all it's all math it's all numbers you know, it's all digital, and that 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 air that I'm talking about gets taken out of the equation. And I mean, I could be completely wrong. Like I said, I'm not hanging out with lots of people in studios anymore, watching what they do. I kind of, I just kind of do my own thing. But that's what it sounds like to me. Yep. I don't know if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it also sounds like you, you've built up a good level of trust before you like as you're mixing and going through all of these steps, like people trust that you are going to get the right sound by, you know, experimenting with getting, getting the proper miking position and all that. They're not, you know, I feel like a lot of bands just kind of don't trust their engineers maybe. And that's why they expect samples to, to be the solution. Maybe uh, that's, maybe that's what it is. You know, there's a generation of of people coming up who don't really know anything about it. To be honest with you, They, they didn't get the same type of experience that I got. And that's, that's fine, man, because people are making great records now, you know, I'm just talking about my, my own experiences here. And, you know, one of the reasons I think a lot of bands come to me is they like the way my drums sound. They like the way the guitars sound, you know, and they know that if they work with me, they're going to get that too. And, you know, I take a lot of pride in these, in these recordings and, and, you know, the engineering and all the time that we spend you know, putting into them, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of time. It's very tedious and it's incredibly time consuming. And you've got to be really focused and you've got to be in a great listening environment. You know, there's no quick, you know, there's no quick or fast way to make records the way that I make them still, you know, but if you're going to use, mm-hmm. if you're just going to use, you know, drum machines and, and samples and use direct guitar and stuff like that, then you can go pretty quick, you know, and that's, and that's also kind of a result of, of the way the music industry has changed. You know, there's not a lot of, you know, budgets to make records have always equaled time to me. The bigger the budget, the more time you get to make the record. The smaller the budget, the less time you have, you know. So I totally get and totally understand why people are probably making the records the way that they're making them nowadays, you know, because I have to deal with the same situations. I've had to figure out ways to make my records quicker because the budgets I get are a lot smaller than they used to be, you know, and I've got a, you know, seriously fine tuned operation going on where we take advantage of every minute we're in the studio, you know, with workflow and I've kind of already got a good idea, you know, just going through pre-production with bands, I've kind of got a good idea of when we get to the recording of what, you know, particular amplifiers and or drums I'm going to want to use in the recording so I just, I just, you know, I just go for it, and I know what I know what those elements are going to be. So you had mentioned that you have, um, you, you're taking advantage of certain things in the studio to save time and to work more efficiently. Uh-huh. Can you give any examples of that? Um, well, like I said, it just kind of, it, 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 you know, just thinking and, and you know, making notes about 
okay, you know, when we when we do this stuff for real, you know, I'm gonna I want to use these particular amps and these particular cabinets so that it's not like, well, you know, and, and we never I never you never use the same stuff twice, you know, even though I might be using the same amp or the same cabinet for a different band. You know, the miking technique might be different, and the, the space is different, and things like that. It's, it, you know, it, it, and, it, and again, you know, if you look at a lot of the records that I make, a lot of the guys in these bands can play really good. You know, so it's kind of like, you know, we get the sounds up pretty quickly, and they sound kick ass, and I just let people play. I just let them perform it. You know. And if I have to, you know, I, I still like the comp mm-hmm. things, you know, I'll have a guitar player play the song, you know, two or three times from beginning to end. And they'll be like, all right, let me comp it real quick. And, you know, I, at the whole time I'm making mental notes in my head or notes on my workbooks. And, you know, the chorus from this take, the chorus from that take, the bridge from this take, the verses from that take. And I go over to the rig and click, 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 boom, 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 there's a track. Okay, well, let's double it, you know. So... It got, you know, back in the old days, we used to spend, we could spend an entire day doing one guitar track from beginning to end. Now, you know, we'll record guitar tracks on three or four songs in one day. Mm-hmm. Really, you know, there's an efficiency that, that has to happen. Whereas, like, you know, a band like Rush, who has, you know, have, they have a bigger budget and they don't have a record company breathing down their neck we can spend as much time as we want making, making the records. I mean, we made the last record. We spent a couple months making it, which was still pretty quick for, for, you know, a, a, a big band like that, you know, and those guys can all play great, you know, and when you work with great players, you can really spend more time experimenting with sound and experimenting with different guitars and listening to different amps but you know a lot of the stuff that I do now, I've kind of, I've kind of, I'm already kind of mapping it out in my head of what I want to use and, and, and how I want to go about it. For sure, you had mentioned earlier that you sometimes have up to twelve guitar tracks in a song. I imagine that when you have that many layers, that gain staging is something that you have to really consider. Do you have any tips for getting proper gain staging? Yeah, um, one of them is don't record everything everything too hot. You know, is is kind of you kind of have to experiment and, and figure out where, you know, where your peaks are going to be. And if you know you're going to be doing lots of layering, then you know you think about that up front and you you know kind of imagine what the sound is going to be like when you're you know ten or twelve songs, uh, ten or twelve tracks deep like that. Mm-hmm. And and you'd also mentioned getting huge guitars and huge bass and you know making that feel really big. What about with getting the low end right? Do you have any tips for that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's got to be solid. It can't be it can't be you know loose or floppy. It's got to there's got to be a lot of punch, and a lot of that punch comes from the lower mid range and the lows. You know, not sub lows. You know, there's there's a division that has to happen frequency wise between the kick drum and the guitars and the bass guitar. You know, one method that I do is I like to record the bass after the guitars, um, get the drums, and then you know get kind of basic, you know, main left and right guitars, and then put the bass on there and find that pocket for the bass that's right between the kick drum and and the rhythm guitars, um, and then start then. From there, I will start layer, you know, start layering the guitars and doing the overdubs and things like that. I like that. That's cool. Yeah, and then frequency-wise, it all kind of starts to come together. You know, then you realize when you start to layer the guitars, you don't need as much bottom in them as you might think you might because you because that's what the bass is for. You know, you know. I, I remember I used to kind of do it the traditional way: record the drums and the bass and the guitars, and I would get to the guitar part and you know, we would record these giant, massive guitars, and then as the record keeps going through and you get to the mix, it's like there's so much bottom, you can't hear anything. And that's because, you know, the guitars and the bass are fighting for the same frequencies. You know, you have to kind of, you know, every every instrument has its role in the mix. And once you kind of figure out what those roles are, you know, and again, experimentation and, and trying you know, blending together different sounds and, and different instruments and different tones.
tones is, is how you kind of stumble across those things. Mm -hmm. So I think that like we all learn from a lot of trial and error and making mistakes in the studio. And I was wondering if you happened, if you can think of an example of something that maybe went wrong in a session that you were working on and, and kind of what you learned from that and, and how you, how you fixed it and what, what the big takeaway was from that. Um, geez, that would, you know, <laughs> I guess you could say that that's kind of a, a, a big question because it's, um, some, an example of something that would be wrong would be like, you know, recording over a track, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. you know, that happened to me once back in the, in the tape days, you know, I had, you know, you're doing a guitar part and all of a sudden you hit the record button and the guitar that there goes away and you don't hear the guitar that you're supposed to be recording, and then you just record it over something. And you learn from those mistakes really quick to, you know, double-check your patches. And, you know, that, with, you know, digital recording now, those mistakes are a lot harder to happen. Um, you know, I, I, as far as mistakes go, I don't know if you really... I mean, a mistake would be, you know, maybe you didn't, you know... Maybe the tone wasn't right when you recorded it, and it takes you a little while to realize that you know the, the, the particular part in the song isn't cutting through the mix, or isn't you know isn't bringing isn't satisfying you know the part per se, and you just you know record it again, or if you have, if you recorded like a DI with a guitar, you can reamp the guitar sound, and you know um, and we, did, we just did that on a record. You know, we recorded a bunch of solos and a bunch of overdubs in the studio, and we got to another studio, and as we're listening to it, you know, over and over, and realized the sound just wasn't the right sound. And luckily, you know, we had a, a DI recorded for the parts, and we just, we re the DI signal through a different amplifier, and we're able to tweak it, and, and without the artist having to, you know, actually replay the parts, kind of, you know, kind of fix it. If you know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds like definitely being prepared yeah. for future steps is, is always a good thing. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. and you know, I mean, I, I've re-recorded drums on the last day of recording, you know. Do a drum track and listen to it for two months and something's bugging you about it because it might not be the right sound or it might not be the right part for the song. It's, you know, without hesitation, man, we're setting the drums back up. We're going we're gonna to redo it, you know, and... I guess if you you could you could call those mistakes or you could call it you know a learning experience or you could call it just you know blowing it and <laughs> <laughs> making it better you know making it great you know yeah for sure I think that there's a lot of people that are listening to this podcast that are maybe just getting started off with recording and and mixing do you have any advice for anyone who's just getting started off just never stop experimenting and trying things out until it sounds like how you want it to sound coming out of the speakers. I mean, there's so many options and so many different ways to record things and to do things nowadays that, you know, the sky is really the limit, man. And, and that is pretty much what got me to where I am. It's just, it's just unrelenting, tenacity and and not settling for anything you know like i said every before everybody hears this in a different way and recording it and getting it to come out of those speakers the way you're hearing it in your head is really you know i, I, I believe the key to, to being successful as an engineer and a producer is you, you just can't give up you can't stop and you can't settle and say that well it's just good enough you know, it, it, there's mm -hmm. it, the opportunity never comes twice. You know, once you make a record and you put it out there, that's it. You don't get, you, you can't pull it back and be like, oh, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, I want to take back my release. And, you know, once you get it out into the world and people start to listen to it and, you know, cause just like I listen to the radio and dissect recordings and, listen to the way the guitars were recorded and listen to the way the drums were recorded that other people have done. And, you know, I know people do that to the records that I make too, and that's fine. You know, that's kind of goes back to what I said before about everybody hears it different, you know. There's a lot of things that I hear that I don't really dig or agree with, but I'm fascinated by it, and I'll listen to it objectively anyway because I try to figure out how they did it and how it was done. 
You know, I have no idea. I wasn't in the room when, when it was recorded or mixed. And I think being open to, you know, listening to music and, and listening to the way other people have done things is an important part of doing this. And for people that are just starting out and just trying to figure it out, it's really about experimentation and it's about, you know, being influenced and listening to music and, you know, listening to new records, listening to old records, listening to kinds of music that you might not necessarily ever listen to, you know, listening to, you know, I, I listen to lots of different kinds of music, man. A lot of people think I'm just some rock dude, but, you know, my favorite kind of music is classical music. Hmm. You know, I listen to symphonies and I listen to all kinds of stuff all the time, you know, and then I come into the studio and work on loud pounding, you know, rock and metal all day long. And then I get in my car and I drive home and I'm, you know, listening to, you know, Mozart and Beethoven and Bach <laughs> and, you know, Hayden and all of those people, you know, the masters per se of, who just started doing this and listening to the way all the music is intertwined. And, you know, I love. Yeah. So, so what made you go the rock route instead of going the classical route in terms of recording? I think the energy, the energy in rock music is something that I've always gotten excited about. You know, I love the sound of drums and I love the sound of guitar and guitar solos and the sound of people, you know, singing and singing with that energy. I think that's why I gravitated definitely towards rock music. And I, that's what I grew up listening to. My mother was really into rock music. And, you know, some of the earliest music I ever remember hearing was, you know, Led Zeppelin and, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Pink Floyd and Genesis. And she was really kind of into, you know, proggy rock music. And at the same time, her parents, my grandfather, was all about classical music. That's all he listened to. You know, and back in the early 70s, you know, when I was little and I would be staying with my grandparents, you know, at five o'clock, it was happy hour. You know, it was time for drinks and it was time to listen to Tchaikovsky or, or whatever he wanted to listen to. You know, so my, <laughs> my earliest memories of music were it was either rock music with my mom or it was classical music with my grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think that's why those are probably my two two favorites, you know, kinds and styles of music. I mean, there's something so beautiful about violins and, and cellos and, you know, delicate parts of, you know, all intertwining and all these different layers of music all happening at the same time. I think the same thing ha is happening in rock music, just in a different way. You know, there's drums, mm -hmm. there's a beat, there's there's different sounds in a drum set. I mean, a drum set is very, very dynamic. Same thing with the guitar. You can have a super, super clean, beautiful guitar part that all of a sudden can become the biggest and boldest and meanest sound you've ever heard in your life. And then you've got a bass guitar, you know, in between those two instruments that's filling out the bottom, you know. And I, think, I just think that's why I've kind of gravitated towards those styles of music and, and especially rock music being what I do as my primary focus is it's very similar. And I like, yeah. and I like the energy, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an energetic person and I like the energy and the spontaneity that, that happens in rock music. Do you think you'll ever make a classical album? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> I doubt there's a bunch of <laughs> classical musicians out there that want to work with a dude like me, <laughs> you know, but it's, but I've done some classical sessions, you know, on some of the records I've made, you know, Rush, for example, Evanescence, um, Alice in Chains, Coheed and Cambria. Um, I've, you know, I've produced, you know, classical musicians playing on those records, you know, get a great composer and or conductor, you know, uh, David Campbell, Beck's father, you know, has written some amazing scores for some of the records that I've made. And we actually go into the studio with him and the musicians and we're in the control room and they're performing and I hear something that I think could be different. And I'll run in there and be like, hey, you guys, you know, and David, you know, can the violin do this or can the, you know, the bass, the big guy in the back on the bass, can you do this instead? And I think they all get a kick out of it because, you know, 
musically speaking, I have no idea what I'm talking about because I'm not like, hey, can you play an F sharp <laughs> suspended, blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, do you do this thing on this note? <laughs> you know, so I think they get a kick out of that. But they understand what I'm talking about. I mean, music is universal, man. It can, it, there's kind of a universal language built in. I, I think we all have it. I think it's, it's kind of in our genes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all how you interpret it and, and how you hear it in your head. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, I know you got a busy schedule, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. So we should probably start to wrap up, okay. but how can people follow you online if they want? Uh, I'm not really, I'm not really online but as, uh, <laughs> you know, as you, as I uh, wasn't even able to get my Skype going to talk to you today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I mean, I kind of got an Instagram page that I, you know, check out every once in a while and I put pictures of stupid recording stuff on. It's, uh, you know, Nick Rasko Linux official. People want to follow me on that. They can, um, I've got a Facebook page for my studio. It's called rock Falcon TN. If anybody wants to, to join up on that, they can kind of keep tabs on what I've got going on. You know, I'm, you know, I'm from the older generation. I've got a family and kids, so I'm not super, super connected on the social media part of things. I'm, I'm trying to get better at it. You know, my daughter gives me a hard time of it and about it. And, um, <laughs> you know, so I'm trying to get better at it, but you know, I'm in the studio working all the time and I just don't have a lot of time to hang out on my phone or my computer and, you know, put pictures of, you know, microphones and stuff on there, but I am getting better. So if anybody <laughs> does want to follow me, those, those, Fair enough. those are the two, those are definitely the two best ways to do it. Awesome. And lastly, any cool projects that you're working on now that you can talk about? Um, right now, I am I'm finishing up a new Alice in Change record, which will be the third record I've made with them. Awesome. And it's going to be really great. And I am going to be starting a record with a, an awesome rock band called Hailstorm, who I've been wanting to work with for years. And the stars have finally aligned, and we're in the studio together. We've been doing pre-production and writing for four or five months now, and we're going to kind of officially get started on the record next week. And I'm super excited about that. I've got three or four other bands that I'm already in kind of talks with for next year. And it's been a really good this year. I made a record with a band called Rise Against from Chicago, and I just made a record with actually the first band um, that has actually been from Tennessee, a band called Ten Years. And that record just came out. And, um, you know, I'm always looking for cool new stuff and, you know, just trying to keep the dream alive. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, man. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thanks again for being on here, man. I really appreciate it. I, I think some of your stories were amazing there. I, I love hearing about all that kind of stuff. So thank you so much. Hey, no problem, man. Thank you so much for reaching out to me. And, and you know, it's always fun to, it's always fun to, to get together with you know someone who's interested in, in hearing you know cool stories and cool stuff and you know I'd love to do it again with you sometime if you want. So that was my interview with Nick Raskulinitz. Man, what a cool guy! Eh? He's got so many great stories, and I think he shared a lot of really good advice about building your career and starting from the bottom and what it takes to become an engineer who works with some of the biggest bands of today. And I think that he shared a lot of really good advice about building the confidence to give constructive criticism because that's ultimately what's going to create the best records, right? You want to be serving the song and you want to be helping the artist by really pointing out the things that could be trimmed, improved on, or just reworked, adding all of that creative constructive criticism when it's necessary and it's going to benefit the song. That's the stuff that's helped propel his career and it's definitely a very important part to helping you grow your career as well. So I'm really excited to have had that interview and to have had the chance to chat with Nick. He's such a super, super cool guy. And like I said at the beginning of the episode, he did mention that he'd love to come back and answer your questions about any of the projects that he's worked on. So if you have any questions that you'd love to have him answer, shoot me an email. The email address is questions at masteryourmix.com. And I'm going to start compiling all the questions and then hopefully we can have him back on so that you can get the answers you're looking for. 
So that's pretty much it for the interview, guys. And if this is your first time hearing about MasterYourMix.com, please make sure to check out the website. At the top of the page, there's a link to download your free copy of the Ultimate Mixing Blueprint. That's a guide that I put together to help you with understanding EQ and compression. And it shows you what to use and what settings to try on different instruments. And the idea behind it is to help you get results faster and to have a quick reference guide when you're mixing. If you're stuck on something, you're not sure what frequencies to be looking for to make something brighter or get more attack, Take a look at that, and it'll give you the answers you're looking for. So make sure to check it out, MasterYourMix.com. And once you sign up for that, you'll also be added to my mailing list, where every week I send out new videos and tutorials and tips and tricks and podcast episodes. So you're going to get a ton of stuff to help you propel your mixing career forward. So make sure to check that out. And other than that, I'll see you in the next episode. Take care, guys. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at MasterYourMix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com.